we are now. But uh, certainly Dundee is the you're, next You're big... looking at me as if I'm going to identify, and I, I'm waiting I'm for not, the I shot. I can't expect you to I'm waiting for the shot to widen a little bit. That would be very unkind. <laughs> Dundee is the next big uh, conurbation. Yes. They, they broke at Brechin, which is two-thirds of the way down towards Dundee from Aberdeen. Um, the uh, the helicopter that was getting our pictures, I think, refuelled as well. So the, the cortege seems to have left, and we are now catching up with it. So that's why it's difficult to tell exactly where they are. Yes, yes. Um, just south of Brechin, we were we were discussing just before we we lost pictures of them. We were discussing Glam's Castle, which is just south and inland a little, and that's a, an area that uh, means a lot or meant a lot to the Queen. She spent her summers there as a child. Her grandparents. Uh, were there. It was her mother's family seat, the Bose Lion family seat. She wrote a letter, in fact, I think she was 11 years old, to her mother, having just finished a holiday at Glam's. And she said, I think I had the happiest week of my life. Uh, she was playing their lovely grounds at Glam's Castle, and it's an amazing looking place, a long, long, straight driveway down to this majestic castle. And she said, when we left, all the local people gathered in the village at the village station and they sang, Will You Know Come Back Again to us? And it was it made me so happy. Uh, what she possibly hadn't perceived at that point is that Will You Know Come Back Again is an old Jacobite song <laughs> written about <laughs> Pony Prince Charlie. Um, but that wouldn't have mattered to her. The sentiment, I'm sure, was absolutely intact. And just as, uh, again, the, what we were seeing just on the edge of the road put me in yeah. mind of, of what we were all discussing yeah. hour or so ago just those little opportunities where people have come out as you say they, they've worked out where the vehicles are going to be driving and they are just Indeed. dotting the roads lining the side of the road there exactly. to catch that glimpse i think i don't have much to go on here but i think we might be coming into the very outskirts of dundee if there's a roundabout coming up shortly then it's where we think i think we are um and so we're, we're you know we're getting as there will be settlements along the side of the road now and we're about to come into a city. If the camera pulls out, we'll get a better idea. Um, but, yeah, we've seen that all the way. It doesn't matter, really, whether there are big conurbations around or not. Yes. There have been people. Whatever there's a vantage point, there's been a, a person. Really striking, isn't yeah. it? Well, there we are looking at the Royal Limousine following and we believe that does contain Princess mm -hmm. Royal, Princess Anne, and her husband, Commander Timothy Lawrence. Um, I don't know... Were the windows blacked out earlier? Now certainly we can see them very clearly, can't we? Um, for her uh, daughter, uh, the Queen's daughter, um, right there behind um, her mother's coffin. Uh, and that reminds us that this is a family moment. I mean, this is a national moment, an international moment. But those scenes outside the gates of Balmoral yesterday, Saturday, they were very touching and reminded you that there is a family involved here. Very, very easy to lose sight of that and, and a family unlike any other, obviously, but very many members of the family in tears. Zara Tyndall, very upset. Pr um, Princess Eugenie and Beatrice looking mm. very, very upset. They were outside looking at all the flowers, weren't they, that, that, were, mm. that were lined up outside the gates of Balmoral, reading the messages. And understandably, very, very tearful, but it just brings it home. It reminds you, you know, they've... those <laughs> Prince Andrew's daughters that I mentioned there, you know, they've lost their granny, and they called her granny, and they talked about her publicly as granny, and, and, and we forget that. Mm. It reminds me of how... Um, when was it? back in, the, 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 in COVID, when um, virtual meetings uh, suddenly took the place of conventional audiences, um, the Queen took to the iPad quite um, enthusiastically. Uh, she had her own iPad, but it was Princess Anne who, who well, not taught her how to use it, but we, we saw a moment when there was a virtual meeting and um, Princess Anne gave her, her mother lessons um, over the Zoom as to how the right button she should press in order to, uh, to make the meeting. I think it was with a group of nurses work properly. And the Queen, uh, in fact, adopted Zoom um, during COVID, not just for important matters of state, for her audiences with the prime ministers and so on, but um, uh, to keep in touch with her racehorses. And if a foal was being born, uh, that would be transmitted to her iPad so that she could see one of the foals she'd bred 
um, actually coming into the world. It was, a, it was a whole new dimension to her personal life at a time, of course, of the restrictions of COVID and also, of course, the loss of her husband last year as well. Again, to your point about moving with the times and, and, and having to, and, and you should as well, but yes, she and adopted the technology. There are people on technology. both sides of the road there. Mm. Yes, aren't there? Quite a lot. I think we are just coming into Dundee now. I'm told, yes, just a couple yeah. of miles outside, yeah, I've, I've exactly. just been told. Area called the Murrows, I think, that part, just to the north of Dundee. And again, uh, for our international viewers, a, a sizeable, a sizeable town. Uh, Dundee, yes. yeah, one of the eight cities of Scotland, now eight. Um, Dunfermline was made a city just earlier this year because of the Platinum Jubilee. Yes, uh, it had yes. that honour bestowed on it. So, yeah, one of the eight cities of Scotland. I think something around 150,000, 200,000 of the population. So mm. not, not huge. A really interesting city at the moment, Dundee, going through a, a real period of regeneration. Um, the, the, down in the waterfront, as... as as the cortege enters the town, it'll go through a couple of roundabouts, then it'll turn right along the Kingsway. But if it went straight ahead over the hill and down to the waterfront, it would uh, arrive at the new Victoria and Albert Museum, which has uh, opened in Dundee I, five or six years ago now, and has really sparked a process of regeneration, almost in the way that you know the regeneration of the Albert Dock did in Liverpool. Yes, Things spread yes. out, other businesses move in. There's a kind of arty community developing down there. It's also a centre of technology, huge centre of the world, global computer games industry now in Dundee, and also health uh, innovation and technology. Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee is coming up with some really ex extraordinary, uh, innovative um, uh, work uh, and a lot of money is being put into it there. Also, very the only city in Scotland that's bucking what is a bit of an alarming population trend of an ageing population. It's the youngest city in Scotland by quite some distance. I think the average, the median age for Scottish cities is something like 45, and in Dundee it's 38. So, oh, that's yeah, interesting. there we are. Partly, it, partly through the, all the, sorts the of, technology All sorts of different, big student and... population. Um, but also, I mean, that's not to gloss over too much. Dundee is a city that has had its problems. Uh, historically, it's, it's um, suffered quite badly. It, comes, it still comes off quite badly in the lists of, of urban deprivation and so on, but there is hope that it is now regenerated. What it has to do is keep all these students who are learning there in the city to be the working population of the future. It has to work out a way of just keeping them here in Scotland. It has to work out a way of keeping young people who come, he, to, come to Scotland to learn uh, within Scotland to be the, effectively, if we're mercenary, but it be the taxpayers of the future because you need to pay for the ageing population. Yes. That's a conversation Scotland's having gently at the moment. <laughs> right. Dund Dundee is also famous, of course, for us non-techies as, um, as the home of orange marmalade. It is. Um, marmalade, Dundee marmalade. Um, I see from the jar it's made in Dundee and Croydon. Hmm. Um, how much is made in Croydon these days and how much in Dundee may be an open question, but... Um, to return to the Paddington theme. Exactly. <laughs> Not yeah. just marmalade jam, I was talking about the soft fruit industry in Angus uh, yes. earlier on, and as a consequence of that, there was a big jam industry. There was also a jute industry. The jute mills were a huge employer historically in Dundee. And then the third J, journalism, jam jute and journalism. It was the home <laughs> of DC Thompson uh, publications who publish the Courier, uh, but more famously the Bino, the Dandy, oh, yes. Jackie magazine. I don't know if Legendary. you remember that. From yes, your youth. yes, that's, a, that's, uh, that's my People's era. Friend, yes, all that stuff. So yeah, legendary British magazines. But Jam Jutin journalism largely giving way these days to computer games, technological innovation, and the arts. Mm -hmm. The so VNA, the outpost of the uh, of the London. Indeed, there's the roundabout I was talking about, and this is Dundee. Does don't, Dundee have anything to do with? North Sea oil and energy? Well, that, the, the, the kind of home of North Sea oil mm -hmm. uh, was Aberdeen, I so see. 65 miles up the road. Mm -hmm. um, sparked, mm -hmm. appropriately, by uh, the Queen back in 1965 at Dice. She pressed, in the BP headquarters, she pressed a gold button which opened the oil pipeline from the 40s oil field and, and effectively then began the, uh, the North Sea oil boom. And that, of course, our reliance on fossil fuels is fading. The North Sea is, is um, draining, uh, although there, are still, there is still discussion about whether more licenses should be granted to drill there. But it's being replaced now by renewables. 
um, and there's a big move afoot, just transition, the Scottish Government call it, to make sure that while one industry goes, it doesn't get completely left behind and they're pushing green energy into to, uh, to Aberdeen as a replacement for the old fossil fuel well, industry that like made it so Dundee has come out in some well, force in the suburbs. It though. has. Well, you're going to see another roundabout coming up in a minute. Anybody who's driven this road from central Scotland up to Aberdeen will know this roundabout because you get stuck in traffic. Uh, all the time uh, and we're going to enter the King's Way which was named in memory of Edward the seventh the Queen's great-grandfather um, great uh, yes great-grandfather that's yeah. correct yes grandfather George the fifth father George the sixth right yes. and so great-grandfather yes um, Edward the seventh the the son of Queen Victoria long after his time of course mm -hmm. but this road was uh, was named in his memory and as the kind of um, the peripheral road round Dundee. And there's a, people clapping, people taking photos, quite a lot of people mm -hmm. clapping actually. Yeah. It's a shame we can't unfortunately quite get the sound on this I don't think but I can see that and a, uh, a continual stream. I mean this has been and just a wait. very very long stretch of people who have stood uh, to your point earlier Robert stand and they are only going to get the briefest glimpse mm. even though the car's slowing down a little but they're still getting a fairly brief glimpse they'll turn um, right at this roundabout and that's where they I was telling telling you earlier on about the kind of grass banks that surround this road and form a natural kind of uh, place to come and watch I think we'll see the crowd thicken thicken up even further here Well, in a moment, I think we'll just be able to see a different camera angle, which also might give us a bit more of an idea of, as Martin says, the crowds thickening as they get right into the heart of the city. Seems quite relaxed. A lot of people kind of spilling out onto the road, but it's all very well contained. And a, a closer shot that we're on here. Slightly less reliable shot, apologies, but you'll appreciate this is a 170 mile journey that we're trying to cover today. So the odd glitch along the way, I'm afraid, is to be expected, but Look, just one flower stem on the windscreen of that car. Mm. Someone's thrown mm. flowers. And let's hear the applause. Yes, I mean, we are talking mm. certainly thousands of people, aren't yeah, we, this is that, the have, start uh, of that have turned way. out? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this is a long road. This is three, four miles, probably, round the outskirts of Dundee before the, the uh, cortege will leave and head towards Perth. So plenty of space to watch. So if you're looking at people two or three deep here, it's, um, it's quite something. Dundee City itself. Uh, begins really the conurbation begins on the bottom of the screen there the houses that you see there and then it moves up the hill and the city kind of covers that hill and down the other side and the the route overall Martin that we were talking about at the start of the day I mean today's focus is is Balmoral to Edinburgh elements of the route will have been chosen to allow people to come out from various towns and conurbations to, to try to give as many people as possible I suppose the opportunity to do what exactly these people are doing just to it's not this is not about necessarily taking the fastest route for that journey it's about selecting a route and going through appropriate places that there's perhaps a royal connection 
Yeah, I think so, to an extent. I mean, they could have altered the route and made it a longer journey to deliberately pass through other towns on the way down. They've bypassed quite a lot. But what they have done is, is taken a route that takes them through some of the cities. If they'd gone on a more direct route through the, uh, the Cairngorms, down through Glenshee, through... Um, through um, a, a Braemar and Blair Gowrie, they would have missed most of the, the main centres of population. They've just taken a slightly longer route to go down the dual carriageway, so they hit uh, Aberdeen and Dundee, for example, just now. Famously, we can see in the top of the shot there the two football stadiums in Dundee. The two rival teams play next door ah, to each other in the same street. <laughs> Tannadice and Dens Park. And new <laughs> housing developments? The golf course, yeah, or the Queen is being driven through her Britain, isn't she? It quite. There's a lot going on in Dundee at the moment. It doesn't seem to be anybody out on that golf course. They are, they are, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're taking their chance to say farewell as well. I imagine. Yeah. So we're about fifty-five miles, probably, from the end of the journey now. Right. Um, something like that, 55, 60 miles from the end of the journey now. But the, the convoy is travelling slowly. Yes. So perhaps another... Uh, normally it would be an hour from Dundee to Edinburgh, realistically. Um, uh, probably another two, I would say, at, at the, the speed they're going at. Yes, for but obvious it's... reasons, because they want people of course. Uh, to, to be able to witness this moment of history. Yeah. And I referenced that one flower stem on the windscreen. The reason I mentioned that, if you, if you weren't with us for our coverage much earlier in the day at the start of this journey, uh, we were intrigued. We were waiting to see whether people would try to throw flowers in the path, reminiscent, of course, of scenes 25 years ago. But a number of local councils had put out requests in the run-up to today, asking people, in fact, not to do that. Uh, they said, please come, please share this moment, but please do not throw flowers into the path of the cortege. Um, for entirely practical, straightforward reasons, they simply didn't want, as they put it, other road users to um, have any problems once the cortege had passed through. So that is why uh, it was striking just to see that one. Uh, potentially problems for the driver as well, of course, but uh, it was a purely practical announcement, but nonetheless, towns, villages, cities, wanting to encourage people to come out and see the Queen's Coffin on its final journey to Edinburgh. Uh, we'll stay with these pictures as the Queen's Coffin continues its journey here, but just while we continue to look at this and, and see the people who've turned out to pay their respects. We've just in the last few moments had a statement through from the Prince of Wales. Of course, perhaps I should still remind you that is Prince William we're talking about. It's still easy to forget this. It's still early days, isn't it? This is the new Prince of Wales. Uh, just a brief statement expressing uh, how honoured he is to be made Prince of Wales because, of course, it wasn't automatic, it wasn't a given. It is something that was announced by his father, the new king. Uh, he's expressing his honour in being asked to serve the Welsh people and that he will do so with humility and great respect. The prince acknowledged his and the princess's deep affection for Wales, having made their first family home in Anglesey, including during the earliest months of Prince George's life. And the statement goes on to say that the prince and princess will spend the months and years ahead deepening their relationship with communities across Wales. They want to do their part to support the aspirations of the Welsh people and shine a spotlight on both the challenges and opportunities in front of them. The prince and princess look forward to celebrating Wales's proud history and traditions as well as a future that is full of promise. And they will seek to live up to the proud contribution that members of the royal family have made in years past. And just a closing thought from the new Prince of Wales. 
Their Royal Highnesses look forward to travelling to Wales very soon and meeting the First Minister and other leaders at the earliest opportunity. So that first formal statement from the new Prince of Wales and his wife, of course, Princess of Wales, uh, and talking about how proud they are that King Charles has asked them to be Prince and Princess of Wales. And it looks as if they will be trying to visit Wales very soon. Robert. Prince of Wales is, of course, um, a very old um, title, um, g going back into the um, Middle Ages. Um, but it's assumed its modern significance um, as part of the mechanisms for making the monarchy relevant all round um, the British Isles. Um, just in comparatively recent times, just as Edward VII, great-grandfather of uh, the Queen, had the first lying in state, um, he was the um, person who decided to invest his son, Edward VIII, the future Edward VIII, as the first modern Prince of Wales, with all the ceremonial in Carnarvon Castle and in Wales, which many of us will remember being associated with Prince Charles. That presumably is to come for Prince William. Um, he seems to refer to it um, in this statement. And without getting too political, yes, it is um, um, one of the strategies by which the Crown seeks to hold the United Kingdom together. We're going to see that in an hour or so's time in Edinburgh and tomorrow. Um, the Crown playing its, its part in keeping the United Kingdom united, as certainly the Queen and Prince King Charles want to do. Well, here is Prince William adding his dimension to that and um, just reminding us that um, there are, you know, it's not just Scotland that's a constituent part of the United Kingdom, there is Wales as well. Yes, and we are going to be back in Scotland in just a heartbeat, but just before that, was I right in saying that it's, it wasn't a given that he would be Prince of Wales? Is, is that correct? It's... Nothing is a given. For example, what's going to happen to the title of Duke of Edinburgh? Um, um, that's been taken back into the group of titles that um, uh, um, you know, belong, to the, belong to the crown. There's quite a strong feeling that Prince Edward, who is head of the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, should be honoured with this title that his father had. Indeed, that was what the intention was. And presumably that would be one of the other developments that we'll see in the future. The Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, of course, being an enormously successful um, youth movement, which Prince Edward and Sophie, um, his wife, um, um, the, the um, Earl and Countess of Wessex, they're only earls, you see. Um, they've got it. They should become Duke and Duchess sometime. And there's a school of thought that it should be Edinburgh that goes to them. We wait to see. Thank you very much for now, Robert Lacey. We are, as I promised, going to head back to Scotland because that, of course, is our primary focus today as we stay with these images of the cortege through Dundee. Let's return to Sarah Smith because she is in Edinburgh, which, of course, ultimately is where the Queen will rest for the next 24 hours or so. Sarah, back to you. Yes, it's probably another couple of hours before we'll see the cortege actually entering Edinburgh, but people are already lining the route it's going to take and um, have come out to pay their respects and say goodbye to the Queen as the hearse will drive past them. Um, and I'm joined here now by Magnus Linklater, who's a distinguished journalist and commentator on Scottish affairs, former Scotland editor of The Times. You've been out looking at the crowds, or gathering already hours before we expect the hearse to come through Edinburgh. What were people saying to you there? Well, there's a huge atmosphere of respect, anticipation, uh, adoration, I might almost put it. Um, people have been there for hours. One couple I spoke to had been there since 9 o'clock this morning, and they've got some time to wait still. So there's no question about their anti sense of anticipation. So we've been talking a lot about how we know the Queen felt Scotland to be a very special place, this wonderful country, she called it, just 
last year. Is that what endeared her particularly, do you think, to the people in Scotland? And we've had this astonishing show throughout the length of the country of people coming out to pay their respects, who obviously did feel very, she was a very special part of their lives. Yes, I think in particular in that part of Aberdeenshire where she was, where people, you know, regarded her as almost as a neighbour. She really felt at home. She felt she could relax there. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a very special place for her. And I think the, the local people that she got to know were the kind of Scots that she felt very much at home with. We've been talking earlier in this programme about the fact that opinion polls would suggest that Scotland is not quite as supportive of the monarchy as other parts of the United Kingdom. But the scenes we are seeing today would belie that. We are seeing hundreds of thousands of people lining the streets to catch just a brief glimpse of the hearse going past. Yes. I mean, the Scots are said to be divided on the issue of the monarchy, the institution of the monarchy. Uh, after all, we had an independence referendum which divided the nation down the, the middle. But uh, certainly, that crowd there, uh, you wouldn't for a moment think that they were anti-monarchy. Some of them might make a distinction between their love for the Queen and their views about the monarchy. But I certainly didn't come across any of that there at all. Uh, and. I was also asking people about you know, King Charles, did they feel as affectionate towards him? And the general view was, uh, you know, they were very impressed by the speech he'd made uh, and they think that he's a worthy successor, so time will tell. And it is important, I think, isn't it, that the, what we're seeing here, this um, cortege, driving through large part of Scotland and the Queen her coffin will come here to Edinburgh. There will be a service at St Giles Cathedral tomorrow attended by senior members of the royal family and then an opportunity for people to come through St Giles and see the coffin themselves as the Queen lays at rest there. For this to be happening in Scotland, to make sure that Scotland is included in the ceremony that is involved in saying goodbye to Queen Elizabeth, feels, feels fitting and important. Yes. Uh, the Queen used to refer to Holyrood House as her home from home. It was her kind of staging post on the way to Balmoral. She felt very much uh, at home there. Uh, and uh, so for her, Edinburgh, St Giles in particular, which, with which she was very, very familiar, uh, was an entirely fitting place for her to be. And I, I guarantee there will be a massive turnout tomorrow to passed by that coffin. Yes, it's going to be interesting to find out how they're going to manage what are bound to be thousands and thousands of people who want to um, take that walk through St Giles Cathedral and to pay their respects at the end. It'll be interesting to see how they manage that. But there'll be more to see here tomorrow as well, of course, because there will be a procession coming from Holyrood House after the coffin has lain there overnight, coming back up the Royal Mile to St Giles through this historic centre of Edinburgh, which is a, a very fitting place for this to happen, not the first monarch to have passed through there. Very fitting. After all, that uh, palace there has seen its, a fair amount of history, and some quite violent history, by the way. I mean, Mary, Queen of Scots, who lived there for many years, saw her, her favourite courtier hauled out and stabbed to death in the room next door, and things like that happened there. That place came under siege. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's, it's been lovingly restored by successive monarchs who obviously uh, thought very, very highly of it. Have you been surprised to see the numbers of people who have come out to watch the cortege driving past? Not really, no. I, I, I think the Scots loved the Queen. Um, for all that they may have divided views about the Union, and of course the monarchy is a, a Unionist institution, but nevertheless, when it comes to the Queen and her years of service, I, no, I'm not at all surprised, and I think we'll see a massive turnout tomorrow. Magnus Linklater, thank you very much for talking to us here in Edinburgh, where we expect in probably under two hours' time the cortege will make its way through the streets of Edinburgh before ending up at the Palace of Holyrood House, the official residence of the monarch in Scotland. The coffin will be taken into the throne room, where um, it will rest overnight before um, members of the royal family come to Holyrood Palace tomorrow and there is a procession from there up to St Giles Cathedral for a service of remembrance and uh, the streets will be lined pretty much all the way I would imagine from uh, where we're seeing the cortege now wherever people can manage to uh, get a place on the 
roadside in order to catch a glimpse of it, they will, as it makes its way into Edinburgh, where hundreds of thousands are waiting to be able to uh, pay their last respects as the coffin will drive past them on its way into central Edinburgh. Sarah, many thanks for now. Sarah Smith, more from Edinburgh just a little later on, as you would expect. A very good afternoon if you are just joining us. You're watching BBC News as we continue with our coverage of the cortege, which is carrying Her Majesty the Queen's coffin. It is travelling today from Balmoral to the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. Let's just remind you of what we've been witnessing and indeed what is to come. The cortege set off just after 10 o'clock this morning due to arrive in Edinburgh in the next couple of hours. And this is a sense, while we see it still travelling beyond Dundee, this is a sense of what we expect.